everyone. Welcome. This is Selena here. And today we are going to be talking about the GI map stool test. I get a lot of questions about this. This is one of my favorite tests whenever we are looking at anything that has to do with a GI tract. So whether it's SIBO, whether we have a lot of hormonal imbalances, whether we have chronic fatigue, um, no matter what it is, we have to look at the gut and make sure that, hey, look at what's going on here. We see a lot of chronic bloating and chronic constipation. And so uh, this is just one of my favorite tests, this and the oat test. And I've been through the oat test before. I will leave a link below uh, for the oat test if you want to see that one. Um, but this one here we're going to do is the GI map today. And before I get into that, I just want to go real quick over some of the main principles when we are looking at these tests to make sure that, one, we are putting them into context. Um, I do not advocate, okay, getting a test, getting a result, now let me just go treat that negative result. We have to look at that bigger picture. So overall, when we are dealing with um, chronic GI issues, there's a few different steps we want to take. There's like the four R's, the five R's, there's different, you know, everybody has their different way they're going to organize these same principles. And the first thing is we have to remove whatever the problem is. We need to replace what's missing and we need to repair. Um, and so all of those kinds of things, sometimes we have to juggle them, sometimes we do them you know, individually, but those are the basic concepts, you know, removing the things, getting rid of things that shouldn't be there, uh, removing whatever is causing the problem to begin with. Um, looking at and always asking that question, why? Why is there a problem? Um, and then when it comes to removing bacteria, we have to make sure that we are re-inoculating and re definitely putting back at the good guys. And sometimes this can be very, very problematic, especially if there's some genetic predispositions that our body doesn't really feed the bacteria very well. I mean, there's a symbiotic relationship um, in our microbiome and in our GI tract between the bacteria and our cells. And so there's sometimes that it's sort of like, you know, we don't quite live up to our end of the deal. And so it makes it a lot more difficult for some of these really, really good guys to flourish. And so sometimes those people especially usually need lifelong um, probiotics and definitely like prebiotics to feed those bacteria. They have to be a little bit more diligent about supporting the microbiome than maybe other people. And so that's one, you know, some of the things that to look at. Um, some of the things to consider and to look at is that we need to look at this bigger picture and understand that, you know, there's sometimes there can be adverse reactions. There's something that is called hemolytic uremic syndrome. And so this is something that can affect your kidneys. Um, it has to do with your, uh, your red blood cells and um, acute kidney failure, low platelets. And so antibiotics can exacerbate this. And so sometimes they're contraindicated. So we really need to make sure that we are looking at that bigger picture and to look at, say, why is there a problem and not just you know, haphazardly, you know, start treating things just because of negative um, lab results. And so make sure we are definitely putting those things into context. Uh, let me see what else we're going to talk about um, is we're going to look at that reason why. So one of the reasons I really like this test, um, I guess I'll just go and jump in there. Let me get my screen shared here. Okay, so here is the GI map that we're going to go through. Um, this is a relatively short test. So here's the page one. So this is um, one thing to note on this test is a DNR PCR based test. And so it doesn't really rely on culturing. So we don't have to have things come out alive to really get the results on this. Um, this first page here is the pathogen. So these can be some very, very nasty bugs and cause a lot, a lot of problems. Um, for the most part here we see, you know, they're gonna show if they're high, they're, we definitely wanna take, take a look at those and we need to do something about those. But also on this page, you know, we can have some things that necessarily are on that higher end of normal. Those two can be very, very problematic. And that's one of the biggest things that I see in the functional medicine is that we still have this range where they are normal, but they're really not healthy and optimal. So it's, it's really important to make sure that you're working with a practitioner that understands that, hey, we have to look at what is optimal and functional and not just rely on these high abnormal results. We still have that same problem that we have in the conventional a setting of, you know, tests come back that, hey, I'm normal when you're really not normal. Um, so these uh, first ones here, you know, especially if we see the parasitic ones, you know, pretty much anything on those, that can be very, very problematic. And the same with the viral uh, pathogens. Uh, the next one, this is really one of the biggest reasons I really, really, really like the GI map. And that is because the H. pylori, that it's that DNA base. That we're going to be able to find that H. pylori, that it doesn't have to come out cultured. Um, and so, Oh, they a lot of studies that show that, you know, potentially half of the population has H. pylori. Not everybody is symptomatic, but here's the other thing on H. pylori that's really important to know is that with H. pylori, you can have 
too much stomach acid or you can have too little. It really just kind of depends on the stage. Generally speaking, the beginning is low and as it progresses, then it turns into high. So we really need to look at that bigger context and look at what's going on and understand that with H. pylori, it can be all over the map when it comes to that whole stomach acid thing. The next thing is a virulence factor here on the H. pylori because this can really kind of escalate any sort of other disease situations associated with H. pylori, which kind of another thing is runs the whole gamut. Then we have our normal bacteria, and you know, we can have too much of a good thing. It's not just about these bad guys taking over. Sometimes it's the good guys gone bad. And so that's another thing I like here is we get a really good snapshot picture of what's kind of going on here with our normal bacteria. Is it imbalanced? Do we have an imbalance just in our regular bacteria that we want to have in our GI tract? We need to balance that out. One thing to note is we don't generally um, treat and say, okay, hey, we're going to uh, do supplements based strictly on that bacteria, on these, um, these kinds of things. We have to look at the bigger picture and decide. So it gives us a really, really good clue to kind of know what's going on. But we don't necessarily always say, okay, here's what you need to take for this, here's what you need to take for that. Um, but we definitely can, because it's a big, 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 big picture on our normal microbiome step four. And then here is some more of the, um, some of these are, you know, also can be normal. And these are more the opportunistic ones. So these are the ones that are gonna say, hey, they're gonna take advantage of a situation whenever, you know, kind of favors the adverse environment. And then they can just really take over and just boom, they, you know, can be like the big bullies here. And so these are another ones to really look at in context and realize that, you know, even a normal can be abnormal, that it's not going to be optimal and healthy. And which leads to some of these other ones down below, which are the autoimmune ones. And so these autoimmune ones are another one that can be very, very problematic and can really help set the stage for these autoimmune situations. When we see autoimmunity on the rise, you know, not just in our adults, but also in our children. We see a lot in women and we're seeing it more and more in our children. And so these having these potential autoimmune trigger markers really helps us to connect a lot more dots to some of these other symptoms and understanding, you know, how these other things are interrelated, how these things are connected and things that we can do about, you know, these different bacteria. The next section is the fungi and yeast. And this is probably the weakest point or weakest part of the GI map is that it doesn't necessarily always show up. And so um, a complete negative may or may not be, uh, this one could be a false negative on the GI map is the one area that um, I usually look to the oat test for, um, which I will put a link below for um, the oat test. And there's also a mycotoxin test through Great Plains, which will test for mold. It has a pretty in-depth mold test, which is testing for mold. So while the, you know, it may very well, very well show up, um, there are times where it doesn't show up. And so um, just know that's the kind of the caveat and the nuance to the GI map. Uh, viruses, EBV, uh, CMG, CMV, um, these are some, you know, pretty nasty viruses here. And especially now that we have 5G coming out, I'm not sure if you're aware of the 5G. Uh, the thing with 5G is that it will reactivate EBV. So they've had studies on this for quite a long time where the, uh, the 5G and how it affects EBV. So it's very, very disturbing um, that we have this whole new technology rolling out and there's so many people that already are dealing with EBV and we're just kind of, I think this is a disaster in the making um, with this whole 5G thing. Uh, next is parasites and worms. Another, like this is a really good highlight and one of the, where the GI map really shines is because we don't have to work these things culturing out again. Um, that we're going to have that DNA based on this for the, the parasites and the worms, which is really, really nice to know. And again, for, you know, a lot of these, we really don't want to really see any of these um, on here. And then we have the, another big shining part of the GI map is the intestinal health, the overall picture snapshot, what's going on in the environment? Why is there a problem? Like, is the body supporting, you know, that underlying support to help fight the battle and help provide a rich, lush, you know, environment for our GI tract. So it's kind of like we have either a desert or we have a nice, rich lawn. You know, that lawn has to have rich soil. You know, it's not going to have this beautiful, you know, golf course, you know, lawn out of the desert. We have to have good soil. So the pancreas and the gallbladder, what helps set the stage for that nice environment for to keep things lush and rich? So the elastase, this is one which it's overlooked a lot. The elastase we really like to see in a functional range, like 550, 600. And so this one here, many would say, oh, look, you're normal. 
And if you have a provider who isn't really well versed in this, they're going to say, okay, yeah, your last use is totally fine. When really, I would look at this and say, oh, we have some problems here. I mean, it's not like horrible, horrible, but you know, we need to address this and look at what is going on here and start asking some more questions. And um, the same with the sciatocrit. You know, we want to look at that sciatocrit. That's going to be more your gallbladder type function. And when I see that one off, I'm going to start thinking automatically nitric oxide is not working well. We have to be looking at the transsulfuration pathway, which is your detox pathway, your bioterin, which is your neurotransmitter pathway, and then your methylation pathway. Those three pathways all work in harmony with one another, very, very, very tightly woven. And so the gallbladder is dependent on healthy nitric oxide production. Our circulatory system is dependent on healthy nitric oxide production. So if any of those things are not working, all those things are going to have a negative effect and then they domino effect back on each other in that really bad catch 22. So when I see those off, I'm gonna start looking there. And when we have that, we have to start addressing the detox because it just affects so many things. We have to make sure that we have good nitric oxide because if we start addressing some of these other areas, like even the detox, we start pushing detox without addressing that nitric oxide, we can actually create more problems because we don't have that, we're, that nitric oxide is going, if it's imbalanced, it's going to create more problems and we don't have enough glutathione to go, go around. So it just really can create habits. That's why I see a lot of people get in those detox situations and it's like, I feel worse now. That's why, because we wasn't addressed the real thing uh, that was, or, you know, or something upstream that was, that was causing the problem. So it's one of the things that a big thing that for me is a big clue when I see that it's like, I I'm going to be looking there. And that's another reason why I like the oat test. This is going to give us more clues as to what's going on also in there. There's a few other uh, tests besides that. I'm also going to look. The GI markers, beta glucuronidase and uh, the uh, cult fecal blood. Um, again, these are some more markers to say, hey, what is going on dysbiosis-wise? What's going on bacterial-wise? What's going on here? This war zone going on in the GI tract. And so we want to address those things. And again, um, not necessarily a normal, may not necessarily be functionally normal. The next immune response, SIG-A and antigladin, uh, that secretory IgA is generally, it's S-I-G-A and they call it SIG-A. Um, uh, we want to make sure that, you know, where is that one at? And again, we want it 15, 1700, generally speaking, is where that one we like to see it. And when it starts pushing that outer limit, so we're like, okay, there's some problems here. Um, and calprotectin, again, um, that one can be another one. That one they actually recognize in... Uh, often in the conventional um, arena and we want to see it less than the 170. Uh, zonulin, so the zonulin and the antigladin, so these aren't necessarily the best markers for celiac and for gluten sensitivity and those kinds of things, um, but it can kind of give you a heads up. And so the thing with zonulin, zonulin belongs in our GI tract. That's what helps us to digest um, gluten. And um, that's just a natural response for our body to open up, to allow the fluid in, to help get rid of toxins, to help digest that kind of things. And so the problem that we have, one is that our gluten is pretty well contaminated. We have glyphosate all over, even in organic, um, you're gonna see a lot of contamination, um, even in those. There's been you know, lots of places where sometimes even the, the organic non-GMO is worse than the, the GMO. So that's where the zonulin, um, where it can be problematic. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have a problem per se, but it's potential so we just need to watch it but I wouldn't um, I don't always even test for the zonulin because uh, really the zonulin if, if, you know, as long as it's where it's supposed to be doing its job fine it's when it gets on the other side of the track it's getting the blood we start having antibodies now we have a really really big problem <clears throat> so this is just kind of a warning sign just kind of a snapshot we just kind of look at it and take it into context and just understand I wouldn't um, solely go on just a zonulin on a stool test because we have to realize that's where it actually belongs. So we should expect to see some zonulin um, in there. But again, a high, I would be like, okay, what, you know, I would recognize that and let's address it. But um, it's not just like, oh, that's the only thing that we're going to look at and, um, you know, have a problem. And with that, with pretty much most of your GI upset, um, no matter what the situation is, we usually want to remove gluten just anyway because it is going to trigger the zonulin, that natural approach. And so we don't want to be adding any type of situation where we are now just a normal digestive process are creating an opportunity for more problems. We're leaving that door wide open for, you know, toxins or whatever to go on. So that's why pretty much across the board and we see in the chronic, whether you're dealing with um, thyroid issues, hormones, chronic fatigue, you know, 
SIBO, all of these things, a lot of times we're taking away the gluten because of the natural response to our body eating the gluten. And what Zonulin does is basically opens up the door, the tight junctions in our GI tract, to allow things to go through that protective barrier. So, excuse me, the next thing we have is the last part of this test is the anti, uh, antibiotic resistant uh, gene section. So this is really helpful so that we know that, hey, there's some resistance here. These bacteria have resistance to these different antibiotics. So it really can help you to know that, oh, these antibiotics are probably not going to work because the bacteria is resistant to those. I personally don't use any kind of antibiotics. I strictly only use herbals. If someone was using antibiotics, this could be very, very, very helpful. So it's another thing, a great thing about the GI map is getting that information on that. <laughs> so that pretty much wraps up the GI map. If you have any questions, let me know. I cannot stress enough about putting these things into context. I love the GI map. Um, it's a great, 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 great tool, but we have to always be looking at that bigger picture and understanding why are these things happening. And we remember that we can remove the bacteria, but there's so many more parts to that puzzle. We have to replace, we have to repair, you know, we have to juggle, we have to look at making sure that we are supporting detox methylation and the bioterror and the neurotransmitter pathways. Um, pretty much any time we get bacterial overgrowth, there's some sort of neurological uh, symptoms involved, whether it's chronic fatigue, whether we have anxiety, depression, um, ADHD, all those kinds of things that, you know, we will see uh, tied with GI tract imbalances. So we've got to make sure that we are also supporting those pathways nutritionally, and we are navigating it carefully because if we do things in the wrong order, we can actually cause more problems. So just make sure that you guys are putting the GI map into context. It's a fantastic test. And this is also the reason why I prefer this test over just a breath test. The breath test would tell me, oh, you've got some methane producing bacteria. Great. <laughs> you probably already know that you've got bacterial overgrowth because of your, you know, all the symptoms you have. We don't know what they are, what kind they are, and really what else is going on? What's going on with your pancreas and your gallbladder? What's going on? What kind of immune response do we have going on here? So, you know, the GI map's going to give us a lot bigger picture on that and let us know more about, oh, these bacteria. Well, we know this particular herb is going to work more for this bacteria over this one here. There's different, you know, you can pick your protocols a lot easier and to know how to address things. And then you add to that the different levels and layers of, oh, I need to support the nitric oxide production. I need to support my pancreas. I need to support my stomach acid or too much stomach acid. All those kinds of things it gives us more information to really hone in and to narrow down and make a more of a unique approach to you versus, oh, you got methane gas, you got hydrogen gas. And it's, you know, very, very, very broad picture. I like to narrow things down. I'd like to know all those details. Um, I like to know more and more and more. I'm, I'm one of those that never did stop asking the question, why? I'm still that three-year-old that wants to know why. Tell me why is the body behaving this way? Why is it responding this way? Because our body is doing these things to protect us. Um, these chronic health situations we have, our bodies aren't confused. Our bodies aren't, you know, the autoimmunity is not confused and attacking us. It's just collateral damage. It's trying to protect us. It's the best way to keep us here and save us. It's trying to, we're just working against it. We're not paying attention to those warning signs. We keep being ignored when we go to providers and they say, you're totally normal. You know, we have warning lights going off all over. There's a reason why. So I'm always like to ask why, 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 why? So that's pretty much it. If you guys have any questions, I hope that this was helpful and you can feel free to reach out to me. Um, you can message me. Um, I've got a Facebook group and many of you are maybe watching this because you're in a Facebook group already with me or you can you know, private message me um, and let me know. I hope this you know, again was helpful and I will leave some links below for a sample report, for um, the OAT test, for uh, the interpretive guide for this test um, and we will talk to you later. You'll have a great day. Take care.